Sweet melodies with Lindsay Anastasia. Hello, guys. How you doing? What's going on? I am so ecstatic today. Um, today has been a very great day for me. Went to the gym, then I came back to do this podcast. Um, I was really, I've really been thinking about a lot of ideas and this is right. Like this is right on why I even started sweet melodies. Um, this episode right here. So I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure (laughs) a lot of you guys have heard about Beyonce, um, releasing um, part two, act two, let me not say part two, act two to the Renaissance. And she has released, um, some country songs, her most popular one, Texas Hold'em, which is number one right now. And I think a lot of people, um, are, are having a wrong, like take from this. Um, First, I just want to say big congratulations. I don't know Beyonce in person, but big congratulations. Like she is really an inspiration to me and she is really shaping the music industry. But I think that this, what people aren't taking away from her releasing act two, because the Renaissance um, is, you know, just based on her childhood and what inspired her. Um what made her want to be an artist. Uh, she's from Houston, Texas. Okay. And country music is really, really, really big in Texas. I'm not from Texas, but every person that I've met that is from Texas, love them some country music. Um, all they do is listen to country music. Doesn't matter what their skin color is. They love country music, but Beyonce releasing Country music has definitely um, awakened some things, definitely has revealed some things that there is still a lot of racism. Racism is not over. Um, We are still fighting a lot of controversial ideas um, every single day. A lot of touchy subjects, you know, um, a lot of touchy situations. That people don't want to talk about. They don't want to be a, they don't even want to be a part of the discussion. So the fact that she basically stepped, stepped over this and she stepped into this realm, um, which has people disturbed. I don't know why they disturbed. Um, but they're disturbed just because they're hateful, you know, they're disturbed because they are racist. Um, so I am very, very, very like, I'm just, I'm excited to discuss this with you guys. And I'm very, very happy that she did this. Um, most people are like, okay, well, Beyonce, she can do any genre she can she can do anything and she can just make it pop and yeah um that is true but that's not the whole main takeaway from this at least I don't think that's why she uh necessarily I think yeah she did it because she wants to show yeah I can do whatever but I think that also is is mainly um the the biggest takeaway from this is that it has revealed a lot of things for people um that just don't want to accept uh that country music is is something that really derived from black culture and um for a group of people to say that she's not really producing real country music um because she's black when black is what started country music is just crazy to me um i'm about to get into it with you guys and no i'm not saying that uh i'm not saying that as to be facetious i'm saying that because i think that um as 
as we are Americans today and just in the world in general, because racism is not only in America, it's everywhere. <sighs> Saying that because this is really fighting system, sis, systemic ideas, okay? Um, we shouldn't just be placed in a, in a box. Now, there are many other black country artists out there. Um, we're going to get into them too. Uh, you know, there are many, uh, other black country artists that have been doing this. They have never had a number one country song on the billboard. Um, and for her to have that, and it's not even playing on the radio. I mean, come on guys. That's really big. Um, Texas Hold'em, which also enters the all genre hot 100s this week. Okay. It is number one. It is the lead off single to a forthcoming Beyonce album. Mm. So let's, let's start from the beginning. All right. Let's start from the beginning. Yes. We're going to start from the very beginning. Okay. We're going to start from the very, 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 very beginning. So, like I said, the banjo is, after all, an instrument with African origins, cousins to the current West African instrument, the Akanti. And I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> Black people are said to have brought their banjos and the knowledge of how to make them with them during the Middle Passage. The first string band performers were enslaved people brought on slave ship and this music was appropriated to form blackface menstruously the united states first successful commercial music um do i have to do i have to show the commercial <laughs> with um white man with black all over their face holding a ban banjo, dancing around in a suit, them old black and whites. Do I have to put that up on the screen for y'all to see? I hope not. A major country music guitar and banjo picking style originated in the Piedmont region's blues, exemplified by Virtuso, black women musicians, such as Elizabeth Cotton and Etta Baker. Some of the erasure of this history of origins can be explained by the ways that from the 1920s on in the record industry, recorded music was segre segregated into Hillbilly Records, which was eventually called country or Western or just country music and was marketed specifically to white audiences, while race music, including blues, was marketed as black music. But both performers and fans crossed these racial lines, despite the rules and despite the idea that this segregation was natural and grounded in the body, in this way, country music, like other American musical genres, have reflected the informal but sometimes deadly laws of Jim Crow. The segregation of country music continues today, upheld by many of the ways that country music is sold, marketed, distributed, and written about with very few exceptions. There was one exception though, and that was Linda Martell. <clears throat> she was a black country music artist who was the first black woman to perform on the Grand Opry stage. Uh, and whew, getting into her story is deep. Okay. Hmm. 
getting into her story is very deep. You want to know why? Do you want to know why? Because the label that she was signed to was called Plantation Records. Um, Just imagine what that poor woman was going through. And then when she didn't even want to agree with what these people said, they basically blackballed her, took her out to where she started driving a school bus and teaching special needs, which is amazing. Honestly, God works in mysterious ways. Um, I think teachers, special needs teachers, bus drivers, those are all essential to our community. But what I'm saying is that she had a passion for music. She was there. She was the first black woman to perform at the Grand Ole Pre. And they took that away from her. And then her record label was called Plantation Records. Oh, my goodness. So getting more into it. Three songs from her 1969 album, Color Me Country were hits on Billboard country charts, including Color Him Father, Bad Case of the Blues, and Before the Last Teardrop Falls. Yet soon after its release and a limited run of public appearances, her album label, Plantation... I see, look, my spirit don't even want to say it. Plantation Records released her from her contract. Marta has since shared stories of racist insults and threats of violence by country music audiences and by television executives and an almost daily wearing down of her spirit. Color Me Country was her only country music album, though she continued to make music professionally and semi-professionally. All right. Um. So next we have Tina Turner. Now y'all know that Tina Turner, okay, whose hits Nut Bush City Limits chronicled her upbringing in the small town of Nut Bush, Tennessee, chose to make her first solo album a country album. So when she went solo, her first album was country. Tina Turner turns the country on. In 1974, this album made up of covers by country songs by Chris Christopherson and Dolly Parton was nominated for a Grammy the following year. But until recently, the album was little known except by a small circle of fans and is still out of print. So you can't even you can't even really find Tina Turner's uh, country music um, album like you can barely find that. Other black women artists in soul and R&B who have recorded country music include Millie Jackson, Anita Pointer, and the Pointer Sisters, okay? And they actually performed on the Grand Ole Prix stage um, with their country hit. It was called Fairy Tale. And they got a mixed audience response. So some people was feeling it, some people was not, Okay. Um, 1987. Okay, so we going up the timeline. Donna Mason charted a country hit with her cover of Green Eyes. It was originally sung um, with Danny Davis. She was the last black woman to appear on Billboard's country music charts before Rissy Palmer broke her record with her 2007 song Country Girl. So this has this has been going on like. So, so long. I, you know, uh, with me, I'm going to pause on that real quick because what I can't just, what I cannot seem to understand was not functioning in my brain is why, why do people steady try to rip black people from their roots, from their culture, from their, from, from who they are? You know what I mean? It's like full circle. You know, when it comes to doing, other um culture culture appropriate situations from another culture that has nothing to do with ours it is celebrated it is celebrated we are applauded 
You know what I mean? But when it comes to us striving to really touch our roots and to really, really uh, feel whole and learning about us and really touching the basis of, of what our ancestors, what they stepped on, what they walked on, it is like people just go freaking crazy. Like, what is that about? How come us learning about our history, touching our roots, folklore, storytelling, that's all we had. And that's some, that's some knowledge that we brought over us consciously because we made the banjo by scratch. Playing, I know that our ancestors played songs. Song songs. Song. Picking cotton. Being a slave. These people have an issue with us wanting to learn more about ourselves. When it comes to us learning about our history and embracing who we are, it doesn't matter the decade. It doesn't matter the time. The point is, is that we're doing it now. Because we have been stripped of so much information. Things that I've, are, that have been DNA encoded in us and it's been scrambled. It's been taken away. Why is it an issue? Why is it an issue? Like that is just ridiculous. Mm. So let's, um, let's get back to Rizzy Palmer, the one that released country girl in 2007. Okay. After the initial promise of country girl, Palmer decided to leave her label and had to fight in the courts to be released from her contract. But that experience taught her the value of her own contributions to the genre as an independent artist working independently gives her the place to tell the kinds of musical stories that reflect a full spectrum of black women experiences. As Palmer tells the 19th news, Jennifer Gerson, I think some of the best storytellers and authors and thinkers and poets are black women. And we are as entitled to have our stories told as anyone else. And country music is a place where black women can tell their stories. Along with her own songs, as host of the Apple Music Radio show that she created, Color Me Country, named after Martell's album that was beautiful, Palmer brings to the, to the airwaves old and new black Latinas and indigenous, indigenous country music artists that far too long have been kept out of the spotlight as the show opening puts it. Palmer has created the Color Me Country Fun for emerge, emerging bipopic artists. Color Me Country Radio has become a place for black, brown, and indigenous musicians, journalists, critics, and producers to discuss the struggles of the country music industry. That is beautiful how Rissy Palmer picked how she how she literally picked up Linda Martell. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Because if it wasn't for Linda Martell, mm, that is beautiful. Okay. So you guys check out Color Me Country. Um, I love it. I just love it all together. I love it, love it, love it. So I do want to um, get into 
a little bit more into Linda Martell and her story, okay? So Linda Martell was born and raised in South Carolina. Martell listened to country, gospel, and R&B music. In her teens, she formed a singing trio with her family titled Linda Martell and the Anglos. During the 1960s, the group recorded a handful of R&B singles and sang alongside other black performers. However, the group had little success and soon parted ways. Performing as a solo act, Martell was discovered singing country music on an Air Force base. This led an introduction to producer Shelby Singleton, who signed her to his Nashville label in 1969. The same year, the label released her country cover of Color Him Father. The song became a charting single on the Billboard charts, and her debut album followed in 1970. Martell made several appearances on country music television programs and released two more singles with Plantation. She also made her first appearance on the Grand Ole Prix during its time. She later performed there 12 times, following a series of business conflicts with her manager, Duke Raymore, and producer. So the thing is, um, with plantation, cause you know, it's a, it's a lot more tea here with plantation. They was that what they did was after they got her, after they got Martell in the door, they started basically putting her to the side. Um, I guess cause she was sharing some of her concerns about the record label's name. Obviously, I can't get into too much details because I don't know too much. But when I do find out more, because y'all know I will go digging. When I find out more, I will put more on my <laughs> podcast. Um, but if you if you look up Plantation Records, they say they are best known for Jeannie C. Riley's. 1968 hit Harper Valley PTA. So there was definitely some conflict with her, with Riley, and Martell. Started getting competitive. People started offering, um, they started offering Linda Martell more opportunities and things that made more sense. She wanted to leave the record label, um, but they had her under a contract, obviously. She didn't really like the name, and she didn't like how she was being treated. She had to endure some really, 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 like, big amounts of racial abuse. Um, and with them dealing with Riley, um, that that's who they mainly wanted to focus on. And they wouldn't they wouldn't allow Linda to leave. And then they blackballed her. They forced her out. This story is very critical to me, especially with Beyonce coming through 2020, because even in 2007, there were still issues. All right. There were still issues. I know, I know, like, Kay Michelle tried to go into country, too. I, don't, I didn't do too much research on um, her situation, but maybe I'll touch that topic, you know what I mean, um, in the future. But I know that, you know, um, she didn't have very much success with it. And we're not going to sit here and blame her fans or, or blame her, her past of reality TV. But there obviously is an issue in this. Why are these people wanting it to be such a strong disconnect from our history, our roots? 
and what we do. <laughs> so, um, this is Darius Rucker, and um, he is speaking on some racism on today, all day. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to listen to his, um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to listen and see what he has to say. I'm going to share my opinions of this as well. So let's get to that. Also, if you guys didn't know before we keep it moving, I do have my own YouTube channel. I just started for this podcast. Um, it is called Sweet Melodies. You can find it on the website. The website is on lindsayanastasia.com under Sweet Melodies. So y'all make sure y'all tap in, subscribe to the channel, um, share it. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's get into this. Long, long time. It has been a minute. <laughs> I'm a little healthier these days than the last time I saw you, yeah. <laughs> Tell me what's happening in Nashville at Nissan Stadium this weekend. It's a great thing that, uh, that's been started. They're calling it the uh, drive-in concerts. And instead of, you know, coming into a concert where everybody's just piled on top of each other, they got it. Uh, we have a great stage in this thing, and then every car has... A spot you park your car, and right next to that spot is a spot that you and your fr your, your friends can get out and watch the show and have some beers and have a good time and dance. So I think it's, I think it's gonna be great. So it's like tailgating built like, in. Exactly tailgating for the show, and then you know everybody's distanced properly and everything. So it's just, I'm looking forward to it. I haven't done anything like that. It's gonna be fun. How hungry are you to get back on stage? Oh, I have. I think I've taken it for granted over the years that I, that I play music for a living, just kind of been doing it for so long. And and you always see a, a, a show on the calendar. You know, you always know when you're going to play it. Not knowing when I was going to play really made me realize how much I love it. I love playing live music for people, and I'm missing it so bad, you know. This is my year off, and I was still playing 40 shows, <laughs> you know. So it's like crazy, and I'm looking at it. I miss it a lot. So when you have time off like this and you can't play, and you get ready to play again. Yeah. You know, you're what, 48 hours? You're hours away from taking that stage. Yeah. Away. Do you have a little bit of butterflies? Oh, absolutely. Especially now that I haven't played. Because, you know, I'm, I'm old now. I, I might forget the words to the songs. I mean, it's going to be... And you're nervous because it's also a totally different animal. It's, it's different than what you usually do with the drive-in thing. So you don't know what to expect with the crowd. And you haven't played. So, yeah, I'm thinking about it all the time. I'm trying to change the set list and everything. It's, it's going to be... I'm, I'm, I can't stop thinking about it, actually. What has the response been to once that was announced that these concerts want to take place, these sort of drive-in concerts? What's the response been? Oh, like? huge. I mean, ticket sales are crazy because people just want live music. People want to hear live music. They don't, you know, they don't really care how they get to see it. They just want to see it. And so the, the response has been great. People, you know, just with the social distancing and everything and, and actually getting to see live music, uh, I think people are excited. I think it's an answer to a big question. I think so, too. I think so, too. And St. Jude is a beneficiary of this as well? Yeah, you know, I'm, I've been doing a lot with St. Jude's over the years. And saying they, it's just, you know, when you're going to do something like this and you're doing it on this scale, you just... It's nice to help people, too. And so when, you know, St. Jude is always important to country music. So, yeah, for sure. Gotcha. Um, I heard your new song. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> it's about BS. Yeah. You know, we, I wrote that one. Uh, we wrote that one song during uh, when the quarantine was in the middle. You know, and it was one of those things where no one was going anywhere. And... and on the TV, all the stuff. It was, this was, you know, one station saying this, one station saying that, and all the BS that was going on. And it was funny because when we were writing that, we we asked ourselves, can we say BS? You know, and but the only BS I need is beard and sunshine. That, that worked for me. <laughs> I have a feeling it could become the anthem of the summer. The funny thing is when we wrote it, I laughed. And I thought. This is what everybody's thinking, you know. It, 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 could be, it, it could be. I hope it is. You know, that's why we're trying to get it out there. I hope it becomes an anthem for people who are stuck in their house. When you sing a song like that, that's so celebratory, yeah. right? What's going on inside you? Oh, happiness, fun. You know, even when I was when we recording it. Because we recorded this song so differently. This is the first song I think I've ever recorded in my life where nobody was in the studio. 
you know, we, I didn't see any guy. Like, I didn't, we did a basic guitar track. I did my vocal, then my producer just did everybody on, on, on computer. He was, yeah, everybody that's playing is playing via Zoom or Skype or something. Really? Yeah, no one was in the studio together at all. It was, he put the, he called the drummer who put it down in his house over Skype, and then the bass player put it down. It was, it was all done just over computer. How crazy is that? For crazy. You? Crazy, because me is I'm old school man. I'm that guy who wants to go sit in this, you know in the studio for twelve hours a day knocking this stuff out. And to do it that way, I'm kind of scared because I don't want it to go to that. You know, I, I want it to stay the way it is. You want to go back to the I want to go back to the old way for sure. Seems like it turned out all right. It turned out all right. I'm really happy with the song. Yeah. yeah. I read words that you wrote with regard to the times that we live in. Yeah. What's what has happened to you internally the, since George Floyd's death that made you say, I need to I need to refocus? The thing after George Floyd died that really made me go, I gotta change or something with my kids. Watching them go through this. Wow. Watching my kids go through this. And uh watching, you know, my daughter sit back and realize, you know, I got a bunch of racist friends. You know, watching watching that made me really sit there and go, I just can't keep living my life like everything's okay because everything's not okay. As cool as, as you think they are. And they're not your friend. They're not the friends you thought they were. And that's that's hard. I, I, I mean, when I say this, it's shocking. But, you know, you realize that if, if you were to stop being friends with Everybody you sure called somebody the N-word in anger, you lose half your friends. That, that's a really tough wheel of life. You are in such an interesting business. Yes. Because you're the only one. And it's a business that's very sensitive to image. And it's a business that's very, very sensitive to how you carry yourself. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, this business, we, this business, one word, you know, it's been proven, you know, one sentence could ruin you, could end your career in country music. Proven. You know, look, look at the, you know, the Dixie Chicks, biggest thing in the business, they say one sentence, every station in, in the business stops playing their music. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, it wasn't about their politics, it was about their music. You know, and all of a sudden you say one thing political that the people don't agree with, they stop playing your music. That's crazy to me. But that's the business we live in. Here you are, and for the first time in your life, you're saying Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Is there is there danger in that for you? Sure, I'm sure there is. I'm sure I've already lost fans. You know, you see what's happening with Lady Annabelle and all it's you know, you're losing fans. You know, Lady Annabelle just did something they thought was right, and, you know. I go on and I read their comments and you're like, Wow, this is shocking that people could say stuff like this. Because they took the yeah. Annabelle out yeah, of their name. Exactly, you know, and and, the, and it's one of those things where you say Black Lives Matter and, and people, all lives matter. Yeah, the thing to get me, Jay, Jay Farrell did a, a, a thing the other day that just was so true. It was so true. He's like, I always say this Black Lives Matter. You know, what's wrong with matter? <laughs> you know, we're not saying better. We're not saying, we're saying matter. And that's a, that's a big problem. And, uh, you know, but we're at that point in our, in, in, in our history, in our lives, where you got to say something. You can't just stand on the sidelines anymore. All right, guys. So, with everything uh, that you just heard, that was a 2020 interview um, that was done right after the, the uh, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, excuse me. But that was after the whole situation with Floyd. Um, the whole situation is just is really heartbreaking. Uh, you know, just to hear Darius Rucker uh speak like that. If you didn't know who Darius Rucker is, um, he does do country music. Um, he's very very popular. Um, he's a country superstar. So I thought it would be interesting to share that interview because he was also speaking on his 
career. He was speaking on, you know, his, his kids. Um, and he was just speaking on the controversy of everything. So I thought that would be very important to share with you guys. Um, well, one thing I noticed the interviewer was saying was, was he was like, um, he was like in this, in this industry, like you're one of the only ones that's like really popular. And if you say one, one thing or one sentence, then you basically your whole career will be over. And I just thought that was just insane. <laughs> uh, hearing him say that, uh, because it's true, but so the, so the interviewer was, was honest, but at the same time, um, you know, like Darius wasn't combative. Um, I just through his teeth with certain, with the way he said things and certain things that, that was said, um, it's just kind of disgusting. You know, he was like, these things have to be talked about right now. Um, and it hasn't been talking about, you know, like image matters and, and this, that, and the fourth. There has been a big giant pool that has separated black people from, from their roots. And it's, and it's like, it's like, they expect us to believe that it was never a part of our roots, never a part of our history. It's just crazy to me. It is just crazy to me. So, um, given a little bit more history, um, I'm going to show some images here. These are the first two black radio stations uh that were in Houston Houston Texas <laughs> um so you guys can see it up here on the screen um very very vivid very very vivid um and here's just showing some of their images and stuff like that so I just thought that was interesting. She was at KYOK. See, when KYOK came down here in 1954, they bought their own disc jockey, and they also had their own hammer man. And Dizzy Lizzy was her name. KYOK patterned all of those names. Those people could not, those DJs could not use that name unless they was working at KYOK. And those names that was patterned at KYOK, such as Dizzy Lizzy, Zing Zang, and Hachi Tachi, they could not use those names. Those names were Star Broadcasting Company, which came down here in 1954. And they bought their own disc jockeys here. And it was a 24 hour. When KCOX Radio, with 1430 Alameda, Neither, they bought along with them, which used to be downtown in the M&M building, when Mr. Lincoln bought the station, and with the Looking Glass Studio, they had Perry Kane, better known as Daddy Keith, though. Now so I'm not going to play that whole thing. I just thought it would be cool to share some of that image with you guys, just to place you uh, vividly there. But um, this is also MSNBC, and they're going to be, like, speaking on the controversy surrounding Beyonce's uh, new song and the racism. You're welcome. Folks, that is going to be stuck in your head all night. And as I said, you are welcome. Uh, that was Beyonce's Texas Hold'em, one of two songs she's on 
on March 29th, but not everyone is thrilled about the icon's foray into the genre. In fact, one Oklahoma-based radio station sparked outrage this week for initially refusing to play Beyonce's new single. A fan who requested the song received an email reply that read, quote, Hi, we do not play Beyonce on KYKC as we are a country music station. Well, the station's owner later told NBC News that it was unaware Beyonce had released country songs when the request was made. But let's take a step back here for a moment. According to Forbes, as of Tuesday, only eight of the 150 stations that report to Billboard's country airplay chart reported having played Texas Hold'em in its first day. And none said they had put her other single, 16 Carriages, on the air. And this is not the first time the country music industry has been at odds with Beyonce. She faced an intense backlash in 2016 for daring to perform at the CMAs alongside the chicks. Let's be very clear here. This is just the very latest flashpoint of the long and ugly history of racism within the country music establishment. You're probably familiar with some recent episodes, like when rapper Lil Nas X saw his viral hit Old Town Road removed from Billboard's Hot Country songs on the grounds that it, quote, did not embrace enough elements of today's country music. And there have been even more foul uh, and even more outrageous controversies After it was reported in 2021 that country superstar Morgan Wallen was caught yelling the N-word on camera, he immediately saw a 1,200% increase in digital album sales. And just last year, Jason Aldean filmed a music video for his infamous grievance anthem decrying Black Lives Matter outside a Tennessee courthouse where a black man was attacked by a mob and lynched in 1927. For years, for decades really, white country music fans have sent a clear message. Black artists do not belong in this genre, which is racist, obviously, but also ironic given how musicologists speculate that the precursor to the banjo, the cornerstone of country music, originated in Africa and arrived on American shores during the 17th century with enslaved people taken from West and Central Africa. According to Alice Randall, professor of African-American studies at Vanderbilt University, black country music goes back to the arrival of the first black child to an enslaved African woman in the Americas. Black people have always been a part of folk and country music. Ray Charles, Tracy Chapman, Charlie Pride, Darius Rucker. And to the conservatives who claim that Beyonce is stealing your genre, you're making her point for her. This new album, Act Two, is the second installment of a three-volume project that is literally about reclaiming black roots in musical genres that have been co-opted and whitewashed. So do yourself a favor. Go listen to Texas Hold'em. It's good country music, and to anyone who says otherwise, well, bless your heart. So there you have it, guys. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. Um, I'm going to get it definitely uh, deeper into some more things with you guys. I appreciate you all. Um, for those of you that are still rocking with me in the podcast, um, I think that, uh, that this is very, very, um, very remarkable how a woman such as Beyonce knows that has literally crossed, you know, she she crossed a a a, ba- a, a border. I'm not gonna call it a boundary. Um, that was imaginary, um, so imaginary that we all could not see it. Uh, we all could not see it as as clear as clearly. Um, that has caused a lot of conversation, a lot of conversation that a lot of people are afraid to really dive deep into. I haven't seen much conversation about it. Um, it's been all very bland to me, but I think it's really remarkable. I think it's amazing. Um, And I think that, honestly, like, we're still not hitting it. 
<laughs> I feel like it's going to be a lot more awakening in all of this. Um, there's no conspiracy to this at all. Uh, this is the truth and it's rare. It's very rare. Um, that we can actually come to an agreement and we can actually come to recognize and actually see what's really going on. Um, just so clearly. So, um, that's what I have for you guys today. Um, have a blessed day guys. Uh, make sure you check out the YouTube channel. Um, and, uh, continue to be brilliant.